Due to the length of this analysis, and the fact that if I were to make a fully edited video, then it would get taken down immediately by YouTube, this is going to be a text and audio only post. If you want to read the text version instead of listening to the audio, it is linked down in the description. Otherwise, you can just watch some footage of me playing some video games if you just want to listen to me talk. Anyway, let's get started. Otaku culture is, at its core, incredibly indulgent. Many consider anime an escapist medium, and more still are particular about what they seek from anime, viewing shows more as a checklist for personal kinks than as an actual functioning storyline. When light novels first started gaining traction in the early to mid 2000s, a lot of them were written by otaku, sort of self-indulgently commenting on the nature of their own fandom, but often twisting and subverting the same indulgent entertainment that they were creating. Series like The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya worked almost as a commentary on the typical narrative of otaku media while straddling the line between embodying those tropes and being a parody of them. What this created was a meta otaku culture, where the joke itself was pointing out the joke. And no series captures this nature more so than the Monogatari franchise, which at this point is the most popularly known work of author Nisi Oisin. Monogatari is a dialogue-driven and indeed dialogue-dense work of fiction by a writer whose love of wordplay and semantics is only matched by his propulsion towards self-indulgence. But let's backpedal a bit here and talk about the Monogatari TV series on a piece-by-piece -piece level. I do think that as this series goes along, its nature shifts in both subtle and unsubtle ways, which depending on the viewer might make for better or for worse. Rather than make value judgments, however, I'm mostly going to ask myself as I watch along with this series a pair of questions. Is this actually a story, and or is this mindless self-indulgence? From the outset with the Hitagi Crab arc, it's clear that Bakemonogatari is highly indulgent, but it's also apparent just from these two episodes that there's a lot more running underneath it. The episodes play around with the themes of lightness and weight, and present both lightness and weight in the density of the dialogue. Maybe it's worth mentioning that when the characters talk more quickly, less of what they say is meaningful, but when they talk slowly, there's a lot more gravity to the meaning. It's amazing how this show can torment the viewer's sense of pacing to make two episodes feel like a surprisingly fleshed out story, even if it's really six or so conversations made watchable purely through visual texture. Arguably through audio texture as well, but I think the acting is a little stiff in these two episodes and the music is downright bland. A lot of the dialogue is anti-dialogue, mimetic, unnatural, and unimportant. The show is overstuffed with grammatical wordplay, some of which completely defies translation, but that's what you get from a show that combines bakemono, meaning monster, and monogatari, meaning story, right there in the title. Plus, the author's name is a palindrome, and all of the character names are weirdly difficult wordplay. I guess that's how Akiyuki Shinbo got brought on to direct the series, as arguably the most indulgent anime director himself. Shinbo's series have always presented over-the-top visual flair apropos of nothing, or to make endless dialogue scenes more watchable. He's always dealt in highly fetishized characters, though I would argue that he presents fan service as though he's making high art as opposed to the trash fan service of your local harem anime. No, that doesn't make it any less indulgent, it just means that he's got a postmodernist mindset. I don't even know that Shinbo is a good director per se. At this point, his name is virtually synonymous with Studio Shaft, and many believe that he doesn't even really direct a lot of the shows that have incorporated what was once just his signature style anymore. But in any case, the quality of Shaft shows has always come down to the quality of the source material's translation to animation. Shinbo himself once said that directing is simply a job, and that his job is to please the fans, and I think it would be unfair to say that he's an auteur creative mind or anything like that. His shows are pandering, indulgent, and put texture over substance, but you get the feeling that Shaft is loving the product every bit as much as the audience is, so this may be as much a self-indulgence as it is an audience one. Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei was a manga series that nearly defied translation with its incredibly dense wordplay, and Akiyuki Shinbo and Shaft brought that series to animation first. Supposedly, Nisi Oisin thought it would be impossible to make an anime out of the Monogatari book series until Akiyuki Shinbo presented presented him with the way he planned to go about making it. In other words, these two creators fit together like hand in glove. But even with the obsessive wordplay between characters who don't talk like anyone you've ever met or will meet, and the heart-stopping fanservice that scoffs at all other fanservice anime to get on its level, and even a bunch of symbolism that probably doesn't lead anywhere, there still seems to be heart in this narrative. The wordplay isn't only used for textural purposes, but also to establish a kind of universe for the story to occupy. Words actually do matter to the storyline, as words themselves carry weight, and the series showcases the influence of different mythologies, religions, folk tales, and brands of magic, which are all places that words and their meanings hold great power. In Japanese tradition, names are a thing of importance, so when characters in Bakemonogatari explain their names or the names of magical beings, it clues us into a certain context. At its core, Hitagi Crab is the simple and straightforward story of a very beautiful, very broken girl. She's been running away from the trauma of her past, and the effect has left her weightless, so in order to get her weight back, she must confront 
her trauma. The story might be too brief to be powerful, but it gives this character an impressive amount of depth, or perhaps just weight, as we move into the rest of the series. Sometimes Hitagi, Hanekawa, and Araragi are really just teasing one another, but certain lines cut to the heart of deeper meanings. Hanekawa stating that men are always attracted to physically endangered women, Araragi's characterizations of Oshinomeme and Shinobu, Hitagi's undercurrent of very real attraction to and flirtation with Araragi, also the increasing realization that Hitagi really doesn't understand how to communicate. I think by far the most interesting aspect of her dialogue is that at the core, she's trying very hard to be genuine and just isn't quite capable of it. Whereas Araragi might be a little bit dense even as he competes verbally with the best of them, Hitagi seems to understand exactly what she's trying to say but has no idea how to communicate it. A recurring theme in all of Nisi Oisin's work is the presence of geniuses who are so incomprehensible to others that they can't truly communicate, and Hitagi may have that brand of pseudo-autistic brilliance. Is this maybe also a metaphor for what Nisi Oisin is trying to convey in this story? Is he trying to show us the beating heart of his passion towards this kind of story and these kind of characters, but he can only communicate it through indulgent wordplay and otaku culture cliche come commentary? The double-edged sword of Bakemonogatari is that within its piles and piles of indulgence, it's damn near impossible to sure-handedly sort out what matters from what doesn't. Dismissing everything will do you no good, but if you take everything seriously, you'll get slapped with countless red herrings. Ghost Lightning referred to the first episode of Bakemonogatari as a trap, and I think it's easy to fall into that trap if you're not geared up on your way into the series. If you are geared up though, the whole thing takes on a very different feeling. These first two episodes are loaded with references to a past event in which Araragi was turned into a vampire and had to fight another vampire in order to help Hanekawa. Watching this show for the first time, it mostly serves to build a backdrop for the story and sell us on Araragi as an interesting character, even though we don't get to learn much about him as we try to get through all of Hitagi's development. Coming back to this arc after seeing the rest, the dialogue is a lot easier to follow and not get hung up on, so it's easier to parse all that's going on and cut to the heart of what really matters and what doesn't. That is to say that if you already know the story of Bakemonogatari, then you've disarmed the trap. Episode 3 sails into clearer waters, as its first half is entirely built to set up one realization, that Hitagi is in love with Araragi, but she doesn't want him to think that she's only hooking up with him to pay him back for helping her. Hitagi spends a long and winding dialogue trying to tell Araragi that she needs to help him with something so that they can be friends on equal footing, with the subtext of the conversation being that she wants to do this so that she can then ask him out as a person who doesn't owe him anything. It's only because Hitagi is so bad at expressing herself, and Araragi isn't quite capable of getting to her deeper meaning, that it spirals out into a massive dialogue full of more tangents and wordplay. At this point in the series, it's clear that Nisi Oisin is actually telling a straightforward and maybe even impressively realized love story in the least straightforward way imaginable. But as long as Hitagi is staying in character, I think it still all somehow works. If we really read this as just the way her character is, I don't think it stretches the suspension of disbelief too far, and in a twisted way, this is actually a pretty endearing love story. Going into the Mayoi snail arc, there's yet another trap being set, or I guess it's more like a mystery but either way, it's an experiment in wordplay that would make most feel the author must be a goddamn genius when they go back and watch it again, knowing what comes later. I'm referring to how Mayoi is actually a ghost, and Hitagi cannot perceive her at all. If you watch the episodes knowing this, then Hitagi's actions and dialogue take on an entirely new meaning, so it's an arc that you simply can't watch once and fully understand. That, however, is merely a textural bit of trickery, but it's not like this arc doesn't have any substance to back it. Hitagi's speech in episode 3 about the word fascination might be the most fantastic piece of self-aware commentary that the series has to offer about its own indulgent nature. She explains that fascination is, quote, a step above moe, which itself is a word that's taken to mean the purely aesthetic appeal of a character. Not as in their design, but the aesthetic of their overall persona. Hitagi hints that fascination is something a little deeper, tacitly implying that the characters in Bakemonogatari are more than just moe girls, even if they undoubtedly come from a similar place of intentionality. It's a way of bridging the gap from the otaku mindset of purely aesthetic appeal and the appeal of story and real character depth. As as such, I think it's also fitting that we condense the questions asked at the beginning of this post into something else. At each point along the way, we may now ask ourselves, Am I fascinated? Episode 4, like the first half of episode 2, is a series of conversations occupying a cross-section of character development, random wordplay, and plot advancement. Through this episode, we get a better sense of both Araragi and of the characters surrounding him by having our first real chance since the beginning of the show to watch him interact with other characters without Hitagi around. While Mayoi and Hanekawa still have a bit of that meta touch to their dialogue with their own brands of wordplay, they feel distinct from Hitagi, which in turn makes the show feel overall less like an onslaught of author surrogate dialogue 
dialogue and also makes it clear that Aradagi isn't one note. Hanekawa's arrival accomplishes quite a bit. On one hand, it further pushes us away from the realization that Hitagi can't see Mayoi because Hanekawa can also see Mayoi. We also see Hanekawa come to realize the relationship of Aradagi and Hitagi, as well as get a better sense of her character through the way she regards Mayoi. Whereas Hitagi avoids children altogether out of her inability to communicate with them, Hanekawa almost objectifies them, putting herself in an authoritative position during interaction. Aradagi, meanwhile, treats children more as equals, readily fighting with them both physically and verbally, no doubt as a result of his relationship with his younger sisters. Episode 5 brings all of what the arc has built into an impressively satisfying climax. The idea that this arc was really meant to develop Aradagi comes full circle, with the realization that Mayoi is actually a spirit which has attached herself to him because of his desire to not return home. It turns out that Aradagi's interactions with Mayoi were meant to parallel his interactions with his sisters, as a stealthy way of getting us into the sense of his relationship with those sisters to better understand the conflict he's experiencing without ever truly revealing the sisters beyond bites of dialogue and the little quizzes that they put on in the post credit scenes. No two ways about it, this is genius writing, and it only gets better when we learn that not only was this meant to develop Aradagi and briefly Hanekawa as well, but also works as the experience through which Hitagi and Aradagi form their bond. Hitagi's confirmation of Aradagi's strength of character leads her into full-on confession, and we get some romantic dialogue between them as she describes the particulars of why she feels the way she does. It's not every day that a character has legitimate reasons for their attraction in anime and can explain them in this way, and Hitagi even goes a step further by characterizing her feelings in an analytical context, as though it were to back up the emotional one. Am I fascinated? Hell yes I am. Suruga Monkey, not unlike Mayoi Snail, is simultaneously its own story as well as a surrogate story, this time in the development of Hitagi. However, whereas Mayoi Snail mostly developed Aradagi via the relationship with his absentee sisters, in this case Hitagi is largely absent while Suruga stands as her surrogate, through her relationship with Aradagi. As such, Suruga's story gets a bit more fleshed out than Mayoi's did, and since it relies more on Suruga's emotions than it does on any textural narrative trappings, it ends up being a more gripping and fascinating story. What we learn about Hitagi is her powerful sense of romanticism and how Suruga reflects this. Aradagi might be more of a realist, but he goes with the flow, making sure to only do the right thing along the way as he goes. Hitagi, meanwhile, reveals a powerful jealousy at any hint of another woman. Aradagi fears that Hitagi would kill someone in her jealousy, and it turns out that Suruga is willing to do just that. In the end, Hitagi is the one who resolves Suruga's storyline by making a romantic gesture towards her, essentially realizing that as long as she's the one possessing the fates of both Aradagi and Suruga, then she's still satisfied. In the end, this entire situation revolves around properly defining the relationship status of these characters. It only happens that in this case, such a definition controls the fates of demonic powers and violent horror trappings. I'll say it once again, this is fascinating. Even when Suruga gets into sexual discussions with Aradagi, which obviously indulge the viewer, there's also a sense of indulgence for the characters. Ghost Lightning astutely points out that the dialogue in Bakemonogatari is often about something, as Roger Ebert once said of Pulp Fiction. That is to say that the dialogue is not exposition in service of the viewer, but actually seems like real conversations that the characters are having for their own reasons. Fan service conversations in anime tend to break away from the intentions of the characters in order to fulfill the audience, but in Bakemonogatari they feel more like real conversations, especially when you take into account the different inclinations that the characters display when sex comes up. Suruga is the most direct and confrontational in her sexual language because she is also the most sexual personality in the show. Once again, this all shows how Bakemonogatari straddles the line where indulgence for the author and viewer meets with meaningful and interesting story and characters. Suruga Monkey is also the most horrific arc of the series so far, with intense scenes of violence and a bit of a darker tone to it than the first two. Nisioi scenes contemporaries and the likes of authors Otsuichi, Kado no Kohei, and Otaro Maijo often write heavily horror-themed stories with the same kind of otaku slant to it, though I would say that Bakemonogatari is less interested in the tone and atmosphere of horror stories and more interested in the tropes and mechanics of Japanese horror specifically. Traditional Japanese horror has a lot of similarity with Lovecraftian horror, which itself is popular among light novel authors in this genre, but the key difference is that in Japanese horror there's often an implication that the human who is trapped by whatever overwhelming force was drawn to that force by some fault of their own personality. In each of the cases so far, the flippant nature of the gods and spirits makes an errant collision with the psychological hang-ups of the kids who encounter them, leading to situations wherein simplistic human emotions have dire supernatural consequences. Nisioi scene uses this traditional horror style as a way to cross character arcs over wordplay-driven rules, making a game for himself that plays down the center of his interests. Suruga Monkey marks the end of the first book of Bakemonogatari. Now, if the purpose of this post were to claim that the Monogatari series eventually went astray into purely indulgent territory, Nadeko Snake would certainly mark the beginning of the end. It's not that this arc doesn't contain any character development, in fact the whole thing is really just an arc for Aradagi. No, the issue is that 
that Sengoku Nadeko is barely even a character. Arguably, Mayoi wasn't that strong of a character either, but her role was more to act as a surrogate for Aradagi's sisters so that we could better understand their relationship, just as Suruga would act as a surrogate for Hitagi while fulfilling her own arc. However, Nadeko isn't a surrogate for anyone, serving no symbolic purpose in the narrative. She's just a MacGuffin girl with a problem that Aradagi has to solve in order to experience a character arc. Moreover, she actively breaks a lot of what the show had going for it so far. Whereas Hitagi was made to subvert and comment on anime cliches, Nadeko simply is one. She's the most straightforward Emoto character possible, whose only personality trait is her crush on Koyomi Onichan. Everything relating to the story in her arc is an excuse to fetishize her as much as possible. She's wrapped up in snakes so that we can see her squirming in bondage positions. Suruga has a school uniform on hand for literally no reason other than that she thinks it's Aradagi's fetish. Nadeko has to be mostly naked so that Aradagi can see the snakes, which also explode out of her mouth. All the while, Nadeko herself seems almost turned on by this, as she actually hopes that Aradagi is indulging in her body. It's worth mentioning as well that Nadeko is the first character to be cursed through no fault of her own, so that even the resolution of her arc has no bearing on her character. It feels weird to see this kind of thing happen when until now the series had made such a point to paint itself as something one level above merely indulgent pandering. Until now, the fan service had all fed into the development of the characters and their relationships. Nadeko's arc is not fascinating in the slightest. At best, it makes good pornography for anyone who shares Nisioisin's fetish, but you won't find a compelling story or character here. Aradagi's development, meanwhile, could have happened no matter who the arc was about. This arc deliberately separates Aradagi from Hitagi and puts him in the presence of other girls who are either all over him physically or clearly attracted to him. The purpose is for Aradagi to learn that he should be putting himself and his lover first, and to stop putting himself and his relationship in harm's way for the sake of others. He more or less comes to grips with this by the end, although Ghost Lightning has an excellent write-up about how he fails in his mindset towards the arc's climax, so I recommend giving that a read. Altogether, Aradagi's arc gels well with where the story was taking him up until this point, but it feels like too little of a revelation when packaged with such a pointless pandering storyline. Moving along, those who didn't watch Bakemonogatari during its initial TV run may be unaware of the peculiar way that the 15-episode series was released. Only the first 12 episodes were released on TV in 2009, while the last three were made as internet specials over the course of the next year. Because the Tsubasa cat arc takes up four episodes, instead of oddly breaking it so that the TV show ended on the second episode of the Tsubasa cat arc, the 12th episode instead interrupts the arc for the climactic episode of Aradagi and Hitagi's romance. Episode 12 is, without a doubt, the height of pure characterization and empathetic romantic storytelling in the series. It follows a date between Aradagi and Hitagi, mostly comprised of one very long and arduous conversation in the car, that culminates in one of the most profoundly romantic gestures ever put into an anime series. Ghost Lightning writes emotionally about how he relates to Senjo Gahara's affection for and possession of the night sky. I, on the other hand, have always related to Aradagi, and returning to this series after having been through my first relationship and having seen so much in Hitagi and her interactions with Aradagi that reminded me of said relationship, the entire episode felt profoundly real to me. It spoke to the most romantic place in my heart that still flickers with a little bit of life even as I live unromantically now. Yes, I'm speaking from a place of bias, but that's what art does. It speaks to the individual and can only be felt by way of personal interaction with the work. That's what it means to be fascinated. In the Tsubasa Cat arc, Bakemonogatari returns to form with perhaps its strongest individual arc yet. Following the idea that in each proper arc, the girl that Araragi helps is a surrogate for other characters, in this case, Hanekawa stands for all of the girls who are friends with or in love with Araragi. These girls are friends that Araragi legitimately cares about and doesn't want to lose, but who are suffering from being in love with him, or in Suruga's case with Hitagi, while being unable to obtain him. Out of all the girls surrounding Araragi and Hitagi's relationship, Hanekawa is the most threatening, as not only the most beautiful and intelligent of the girls, but the closest friend of Araragi, and the one who has had the opportunity to confess her feelings to him the longest. In the final episodes, Hanekawa serves not only as a test for Araragi's love of Hitagi, but also as a tool to help Araragi properly contextualize his relationships with each of the characters. Besides ostensibly being the character most in love with and most appealing to Araragi, she's also the character most in need of his help, and who can most specifically be helped only by him. If it really was in his nature to do anything for anyone, and he was only dating Hitagi as a way of going with the flow, then he would have hooked up with Hanekawa. But through this incident, he instead comes to terms with the fact that he really is purely in love with Hitagi. Aradagi also has to come to grips with the responsibility that he has towards others in taking care of himself. He finally realizes that trying to take on everyone's pain, even at the cost of his own life, will only cause others to suffer in turn, and realizes the need to allow reciprocation from others. That's what friends are for, after all. In turn, this kind of makes the Nadako arc even worse, since this one teaches the same lesson, but more thoroughly. Just as Hitagi made Aradagi come to equal terms with her before she would confess her love to 
to him, Adoragi must come to equal terms with the rest of the girls so that they can all be friends. And in typical Nisioisin fashion, the character who best represents this change only shows up at the end, with Shinobu jumping to Adoragi's aid as soon as he's ready to ask. Needless to say, this arc is fascinating. It is full of indulgent fan service, down to the way that Black Hanakawa constantly integrates cat noises into all of her dialogue, but all of it works right into the narrative. Black Hanakawa is literally the release of Hanekawa's sexual frustration, so it would be stranger if she wasn't a highly sexual character. Again, like all of the strong arcs in this show, it's all about taking the openly indulgent and grounding it in true feelings, elevating it beyond the level of aesthetic appeal into true fascination. So now, let's talk about Nisemonogatari. First, we need a bit of context. We'll begin by understanding that Nisei Oisin is a ludicrously prolific author. It's not uncommon for light novel authors to publish two or three books a year, but Nisei Oisin will often do the same with multiple continuous stories at the same time. When he started Bakemonogatari in 2006, he was coming right off the heels of his nine-volume debut series Zaregoto, which ran from 2002 through 2005, and also had a ton of spin-off stories that he would continue writing over the years. The first three arcs of Bakemonogatari were originally short stories that Nisio wrote for a magazine, which were then collected into a volume and then followed by two more short stories in the totally new second volume. These were published in the same year that Nisio wrote tie-in novels for both the popular Death Note and XXXHolic franchises, among other shorts. By this point, Nisio was taking off as one of the most popular light novel authors around. Directly after Bakemonogatari, Nisio launched into the insane stunt novel series Katanagatari, which has no relation to the Monogatari series, for which he wrote one short novel each month for 12 months from January through December. Shortly thereafter, he wrote Kizu Monogatari, which tells the story of what happened between Aradagi and Shinobu before the start of Bakemonogatari, which has a film adaptation planned but not yet released. And then later that year, he put out Nisei Monogatari. In the afterword of the first book of Nisei Monogatari, Nisio says that he had no intention of ever publishing the story. He had written it purely for his own sake as a way of indulging in all the things he wanted from a story, unbound from any publication restrictions. He refers to the book as unprofessional and stupid, something he wrote for no one else to see. But of course, it did get seen. Maybe because Bakemonogatari had gotten popular, or because he himself had gotten popular, but whatever the case, Nisei Monogatari was passed by the editors and published as a full entry in the series. Now let's talk about Studio Shaft. Shaft has always been known for being understaffed and under budgeted. A lot of why their shows are so stylistic is to make up for the fact that they feature so little actual animation due to the lack of a budget and time. They are also known for going back and fixing a lot of stuff for the DVD and Blu-ray releases so that they look better. When Bakemonogatari aired, a lot of the episodes were downright unfinished. There were constant empty frames with the words missing frame written inside of them, where the animators straight up hadn't been able to finish working on the episodes before they were televised. Most of what would have been the best looking scenes in the show were almost non-existent, and a lot of ugly frames had to be touched up later. However, when those Blu-rays did come out, they were unfathomably popular. Bakemonogatari set new records for pre-orders and purchase of anime on Blu-ray, utterly destroying its competition for that series. For otaku-centric entertainment, Blu-ray and character goods sales are the ultimate goal of production, so between its record-setting sales and healthy production of figures and other items, some of which I even own, Bakemonogatari was massively successful. It's most likely because of Shaft and Aniplex's massive success with Bakemonogatari that they were able to pour far more effort and money into the production of Maho Shoujo Madoka Magica in 2011, and that's what ultimately sealed the deal. Madoka broke the very records that Bakemonogatari had set and became enormously popular even in the West. Shaft have been known to make as many seasons of their shows as they can get away with, even over the course of impressive lengths of time, so it wouldn't have been surprising if they came back to the Monogatari franchise no matter what. However, thanks to the massive success that Bakemonogatari had become, and the power that it and Madoka had given Shaft, they were now able to approach the second season with a lot more money and manpower. And so, they poured all of that into making Nisei Monogatari. Nisei Monogatari is pornography. I don't just mean that in terms of having sexually charged content, although there's no doubt that Nisei Monogatari contains some of the most erotically detailed sequences ever put to animation. In fact, a lot of the scenes feel like a game of constant sexual one-upmanship as characters get more and more lewd for longer and longer stretches of episode, usually for no particular reason other than titillation. Not to say that these scenes are necessarily out of character for those involved, but more like the series is going out of its way to present that aspect of the characters and not much else about them. Plus, a startling number 
of scenes in Nisei Monogatari serve zero narrative purpose. Now, in spite of the negative connotations attached to a lot of the words I just used, this isn't intended as a criticism of Nisei Monogatari so much as a critique. There's nothing inherently wrong with indulgent scenes of dialogue and fan service so long as they don't contradict the nature of the story and characters. Having scenes which aren't connected to a central narrative can still flesh out characters or even simply give the viewer more time with them to form deeper connections. For instance, Suruga's largely pointless scenes in the second and third episodes still manage to flesh out her character in subtle ways that can add to the viewer's overall appreciation of her. I would say, however, that in this regard, Nisei Monogatari is coasting on the goodwill bought by Bake Monogatari. After all, no one would care about these characters had they not already been part of a gripping narrative and development in the course of the last 15 episodes. Had Bake Monogatari been like Nisei Monogatari, we'd end up with a cast of purely aesthetic characters with no real core, but instead, Nisei Monogatari serves to add more texture to characters that we are already attached to. This might not be as powerful as fulfilling new arcs and narratives using those characters, but it isn't without value. The thing is that enjoying Nisei Monogatari on a moment-to-moment -moment level comes down much more on the viewer's alignment with Nisei Oisin's kinks. Whereas Bake Monogatari could win viewers' his love for the characters, Nisei Monogatari takes that appreciation for granted and hopes that you're as interested in seeing these characters making sexy poses while telling obscure linguistic jokes as Nisio is. Nisei Monogatari adds to the characters, but it may also be a case of too much information, getting too intimate with characters we're only meant to be friends with. If you liked Suruga as a character but didn't necessarily want her ass in your face or to listen to her puns all day, then Nisei Monogatari does not offer much. Alright, I'm being somewhat unfair. It's not that the two arcs of Nisei Monogatari don't have storylines, it's simply the way these stories are told and how the format has changed from Bake Monogatari that creates the different nature of this series. The Karen B arc is seven episodes long and involves every character in the series, often in even larger capacities than they've ever been seen before. Yet most of the characters don't need to be there. The storyline is full of excuses for Araragi to visit each of the girls and have winding, fanservice-laden conversations with them, regardless of how tiny their effect on the narrative may be. Maybe this shouldn't be surprising since Nisei Mono translates to fake, meaning that the series title is literally fake story. It's exactly what it says on the tin. I may have said earlier that the fanservice is alright as long as it feels in character, but in Nisei Monogatari, the characters do all seem to bleed together. Teasing Araragi has always been a constant in dialogue for this franchise, but it's a lot more ubiquitous this time around. Hitagi and Suruga are up to their usual teasing, and Mayoi is turned up a little, but more surprising is Hanekawa's teasing when she had mostly been tame outside of Black Hanekawa mode. It's not that she's out of character, but in going to the fringes of what one might expect from her character in the midst of a series where everyone else is already teasing Araragi, it feels less unique. Not to mention that both of Araragi's sisters tease him as well, and Shinobu finally starts talking after a whole season of silence only to have a personality that's like a looser version of Hitagi's. It feels like all of these girls are sadists in some kind of strange verbal SM game. Maybe I'm being harsh because the actual storyline of Karen B is mostly nonsense. The conflict between Araragi and his sisters, around which most of the scenes involving those sisters revolve, is weirdly semantic even for this series and doesn't end up providing any kind of arc for the sisters at all. If anyone gets the short end of the stick this arc, it's Karen, whom, not unlike Sengoku Nariko, doesn't have enough intrigue to stand up as a fully fledged character. Moreover, the arc's villain, Kaiki, is meant to be a fake and fulfills that purpose perfectly. The problem is that a fake story is inherently uninteresting. This is probably Nisio's self indulgence once again to knowingly create an anti story with the only function of pushing Araragi into increasingly intense sexual scenarios. It leaves me wondering though, why introduce Karen and Kaiki this way? I know that the book wasn't meant to be published, but it did get published and animated, so now we've got a character with the second most boring introduction in the series. It's not like Nisio couldn't have written a side story of just Araragi hanging out with each of his friends if all he wanted to do was write self-fulfilling fanservice. Plenty of entire series are staked on character aesthetic dialogue, so why even bother with a storyline? The problem with the Karen B arc is that it's still a part of the series. It's not a side story to be read by those wishing to indulge themselves in fanservice for the characters they love, but is in fact the whole introductory piece for two characters, and bad enough at being that that it leaves us with more characters who aren't nearly as interesting as their contemporaries within the same series. Karen B is a spectacle arc. It features many of the best looking scenes Shaft has ever been responsible for, between impressive feats of action in Karen's combat sequences and mind-blowingly erotic fanservice that shits on everything else in the medium. But that's all it is. It's all texture. Parts of it are fun to watch, but for this series it's surprising that the dialogue scenes in the last episode feel like a chore to sit through in comparison to the action scenes that came before. Bakemonogatari was fascinating precisely because it went above and beyond mere aesthetic. The Karen B arc is nothing but aesthetic. Tsukihi Phoenix is more of the same, but somehow far, far worse.
worse. At least Karen B gave half-assed context for Adadaki to travel to every girl and have his porn scenes with them. Meanwhile, the first two episodes of this arc are nothing but straight up Cadden porn with a flimsy pretext that isn't even related to the main narrative and has no real climax. With Cadden having been an uninteresting character to begin with, her scenes feel hollow and she comes across more as Nisioi scenes sex object than any kind of character. Tsukihi gets some porn scenes as well, but actually barely appears in the arc at all. Karen may have seemed like a bit player in her own arc, but at least she was directly involved in the main conflict. While Tsukihi's immortal being drives the conflict in her arc, she is completely oblivious to said conflict and doesn't interact with it at all. Between the three middle school girls that Nisio uses as sex objects, Tsukihi has the least presence of all. The aforementioned conflict is the most cliched and straightforward that the series has ever presented. Its antagonists completely rely on Oshino and Kaiki for their flimsy characterization and ultimately don't get anything done. They're as forgettable as the fact that Tsukihi Phoenix even had a story arc to begin with. What puts this arc over the edge though is how it just decides to forget about any of Aradagi's relationships with girls his own age. This whole arc is just for the lollies as only Karen, Tsukihi, Mayoi, and Shinobu get scenes with Aradagi and all of them unsubtly suggest Aradagi's attraction to these girls even to the point that he seems ready to cheat on Hitagi with any of them. Suruga and Hanekawa make guest appearances briefly and Aradagi even outright states his sexual interest in Hanekawa. All along there's been a subtext throughout the series that Aradagi is attracted to the girls around him and many jokes have been pointed that way, but usually Aradagi is resistant to the idea of being with any of these girls and Hitagi usually isn't far behind to remind him who he's meant to be dating. But in this arc, Hitagi literally makes no appearances and is barely even mentioned until the ending credits scene. Meanwhile, Aradagi indulgently involves himself sexually with all of these girls in ways that honestly could constitute cheating in most people's books. Even if Hitagi is okay with adultery as she suggested in Karen B arc, it's kinda weird how okay with it Aradagi is all of a sudden after all the pushing he did from it with Suruga in the past. All of this is mindless self-indulgence, and it leaves us with the question of where this series is going to go from here. I've been saying all along that Bakemonogatari is a highly indulgent series, but whereas it began as a mindful one, it became a mindless one. However, as we've discussed, Nisi Oisi never intended to publish Nisei Monogatari and wrote it for no purpose other than self-indulgence to begin with. Thus, the question becomes, where will he go from here? The dam has already been burst on the Monogatari series, allowing itself to mindlessly indulge. So will Nisi Oisin and Shaft even bother creating meaningful stories anymore? Nisei Monogatari must have been another big hit because we did get the opportunity to find out. Being as it is a popular light novel series, of course there wouldn't only be five volumes. And as of 2010, perhaps in reaction to the incredibly popular Bakemonogatari TV series having taken off in 2009, Nisi Oisin went full tilt pumping out Monogatari books. The final book planned for release September 2014 is the 18th in the series, meaning that 13 of them were released in the span of five years. This still wouldn't be too unnatural for a light novel series, though the fact that Nisi Oisin juggles this with several other series and tons of shorts makes it doubly impressive. And of course, since it's so popular, Shaft were bound to keep animating it. After Nisei Monogatari in early 2012, they made a four episode OVA for the first book of Neko Monogatari later that year, and a whopping 26 episode second season of the Monogatari series across most of 2013. A five episode adaptation of Hana Monogatari was then slated for a one day release in August 16th, 2014, and it won't be surprising if the series keeps going to the conclusion of the Monogatari book series. In other words, even though we've already had one complete story of fascination and one complete story of pornography, we're not even halfway done with the Monogatari series as it currently stands. So let's see where it goes. The four episode Tsubasa family OVA tells the story of Hanekawa's first transformation into black Hanekawa set before Bakemonogatari. On one hand, it makes for a decent enough story as Hanekawa has always been one of the most interesting characters in the series. On the other, however, most of the story was already told in the original Tsubasa cat arc and even expanded upon back then, so a lot of this arc contains an unshakable sense of sameness. Most of what the story does have to offer is fleshing things out. Oshino Meime and Shinobu both get a little bit more characterization, and perhaps the most interesting bit is learning more about what aberrations are and how they work. Hanekawa's nature as the real deal gets fleshed out a lot more, and seeing how Adadagi acts here gives a somewhat better sense of how much he's grown by the time of the Tsubasa cat arc. As is common to Nisioisin stories, and increasingly so as the Monogatari series has gone along, the story also provides a vehicle for Nisio to prattle on and on about his views on society and genius, which occasionally touches on interesting 
interesting or relevant topics, but often just feels like empty semantics. It's difficult to determine how much of this OVA's value is unique to the storyline, but it's certain that the original Tsubasa cat arc got a hell of a lot more done in the same amount of time. As far as indulgence goes, the early episodes of this arc definitely go down the road of Nise Monogatari style mindless fanservice, while the rest operates more inside of Bake Monogatari's mindful fanservice. At this point, the series is no longer walking the line between aesthetic and empathetic appeal, but is playing jump rope with it. With all of the backstory novels and unintentionally published pornography behind us, the question of whether the show will return to Bake Monogatari's form or continue to jump rope with indulgence remains as we move into the second series. Right off the bat, the Tsubasa Tiger arc establishes itself as something very different from what we've had, in that it's narrated and told from the perspective of Hanekawa. Up until now, the entire series has taken place inside of Araragi's head, and over time we've gotten to know his character in and out, from his perverse proclivities to his self-destructively helpful nature. Moving away from his character immediately changes the tone of the series dramatically, providing a giant breath of fresh air for a series that was quickly being bogged down in sameness from arc to arc. Perhaps most noteworthy about this change is how it confirms Ghost Lightning's suspicions from the beginning that Araragi was a stand-in for the audience in the way that said audience interacts with the girls that they see in anime. As soon as Hanekawa has the reins, the perverted thoughts and subtext in most of the indulgent fan service goes out the window. The male gaze, or more specifically the otaku gaze, has been taken away, revealing what the series might look like through the eyes of someone who isn't constantly sexualizing all of the female characters. This even becomes blatant in the dialogue when Hitagi does strip into her underwear and starts asking Hanekawa to take a bath with her, because Hitagi says that she wants to be able to describe Hanekawa's figure to Aradagi, and even says, let's take a bath for Aradagi's sake. She couldn't more blatantly be using Aradagi as a stand-in for the viewer. It's like Nisi Oisin is admitting to the audience that the story being told here isn't inherently sexual, nor would Hanekawa tell it sexually, but that it must ultimately contain sexual elements to appease the audience. I don't doubt that Nisio is affectionate towards the otaku audience of which he is a member, and is probably glad to include these scenes regardless, but there's this distinct feeling that Nisio is showing us how we actually have to take a break from a compelling story to take in a requisite fanservice scene, because we as otaku are so concerned with aesthetic that we can't even make it through a good story. Critique of the audience, and probably of the self aside, the best thing about the Tsubasa Tiger arc's beginning is that Araragi completely isn't there. Hitagi takes his place as the one trying to help Hanekawa and has a totally different rhythm with her than what we've seen from these characters until now. This is us really getting to see a new side of these characters, which is what a continuing series should be setting out to do, and for that it's commendable. Over the course of Tsubasa Tiger, Hanekawa meets most of the other girls in the series and finds herself being analyzed by each of them. She ends up being the topic of almost every conversation that she's involved with, and most of the time characters are telling her about what they perceive to be wrong with her. The Tsubasa family arc's expansion of her character is actually kind of justified in that it provides the grounds for how Hitagi interprets Hanekawa throughout Tsubasa Tiger. Hitagi thinks that Hanekawa's problem is a lack of street smarts and over-reliance on the so-called correct way of doing things. She says that Hanekawa is too perfect and too correct in ways that work to her detriment. Hanekawa seems to simply abide through all of everyone's critique of her until she is confronted by Gaien, who outright calls her an idiot and reverses Hanekawa's catchphrase by stating that she does, in fact, know everything. Ultimately, this entire arc consists of others recognizing the weakness in Hanekawa and trying to help her grow stronger. It's spelled out right in the opening theme with the lyrics, it's not healthy for a princess to wait around for a prince to save her, what this arc is trying to do by cutting Araragi out of the picture. Everyone's constant analysis of Hanekawa comes a little too close to sounding like more of Nisi Oisin's endless semantic thought dumping, but here at least, the characters interpret things differently enough and even through some minor contradictions that it feels like more than just one voice rattling on and on throughout a variety of mouths. On the subtextual side, it's worth noting that throughout Hanekawa's encounters, there's always a feeling of peace, as most of the other characters admire her and want to do right by her. Even when Hitagi teases her, she does it while exalting her, which is the opposite of how she treats Araragi. All of the music in this arc is a lot more chilled out, and it somehow gives a vibe more similar to the studio and director's previous work, Hidamari Sketch, than to the Araragi-driven Bakemonogatari. There's also some more direct commentary on the audience when Araragi's sisters talk about how their boyfriends don't exist in Araragi's mind. Just as in otaku culture, it's a cardinal sin for moe girls to lack purity or have relationships outside of what they have with the main character, Araragi chooses to ignore any aspect of his sisters that doesn't pertain to him. After pinpointing Araragi's reaction as jealousy, Hanekawa also recognizes this as her own flaw, weaving the text and the subtext together. In the end, Araragi does come to save Hanekawa, but the arc was never about her finding the strength to win her battles. It was about her owning her weaknesses and becoming a well-rounded individual. This, for the first time in a while, is kinda fascinating. Mayoi Zhang Shi puts us back inside Araragi's head, but is also without question the weirdest and most different arc of the series so far. If anything, it feels like a random 
random side story with barely any relevance to the existing plot and characters, and a surprising amount of changes to the usual formula of the series. Even on a basic level, a lot of the winding semantic conversations are missing or toned down, and Aradagi almost doesn't get teased at all. But maybe more noteworthy is an utter lack of sexual fanservice. There is fanservice in some ways, and some sexually charged dialogue, but it feels playful and without any perverse intent. There's no nudity or even much underwear, no panning shots of characters as curvaceous bodies, and even the romantic dialogue between Shinobu and Aradagi lacks any sexual undercurrent. In terms of sexuality, it's the least indulgent arc of the series so far. And yet, in terms of storyline, it may actually be the most indulgent. Mayoi Zhang Shi is about Aradagi and Shinobu time traveling, at first so Aradagi can get his summer homework done on time, and then so they can try and prevent Mayoi's death, which they do, only to find out that in doing so, they accidentally created a future wherein Aradagi gets killed by Black Hanekawa during the Tsubasa cat arc, and Shinobu, so hurt that Aradagi didn't find her in time, decides to destroy the world in rage. Yeah, it's completely nuts compared to the rest of the series that mostly deals with simple stories of emotions manifesting into monsters and being resolved by character growth. Dialogue in the Monogatari series, which is pretty much everything in the Monogatari series, is usually split evenly between exposition, random semantic hijinks slash Araragi teasing, and Nisio's endless pontifications. However, in this arc, the exposition takes center stage, as time traveling and figuring out the differences between different timelines involves tons of rules and minute characteristics of events requiring explanation. It feels like watching an episode of Toaru Majutsu no Index more than anything. Maybe the biggest thing that sets this arc apart is how, for four whole episodes, Aradagi and Shinobu are basically the only relevant characters, with little sprinklings of Mayoi and a cameo of Hanekawa as a little girl. Most of the other characters are mentioned in passing at most. It's a surprisingly watchable combination, as Aradagi and Shinobu develop one of the more casual repertoires in the show. Like, Nisioi scene was considering the possibility that these two would have made a great combination if they had their own adventure show separate from the rest of the series. Shinobu does get some solid moments in the process, so I can see where Nisioi scene was coming from. Overall, though, in choosing to be a straightforward adventure series without much going on below the surface, Mayoi Zhang Shi feels way less dense than what I've come to expect from Monogatari. I wouldn't call it one of the best arcs of the series, but it is entertaining enough, and definitely not like anything we've seen before. Nadako Medusa puts us inside Nadako's head this time, once again changing the tone of the series considerably, and immediately it starts using the Nadako snake arc as a springboard to expand on her character, as should have happened long ago. Right off the bat, Nadako is confronted with the fact that in this world there are no victims, a theme which Nadako snake had foolishly ignored. It's as if Nisioi scene was pointedly trying to make up for past mistakes by retconning Nadako snake into a bigger narrative, which is a great way to go about it. Whereas Hanekawa's world always felt sort of serene and peaceful, Nadako's feels claustrophobic and stressful. Moreover, hers is the first universe in which people not directly relevant to her exist. They aren't drawn as actual people, but in Aradagi and Hanekawa's worlds, there simply were no human beings whatsoever besides the one that those characters directly interacted with. Nadako's world has classmates and passerbys, but they create a strange, overwhelming sensation, as if all of them are somehow antagonistic. The whole presentation drips with the sense of anxiety and paranoia that Nadako exhibits. Also, just like in Miyoi Zhangshi, this arc is almost totally devoid of fanservice. There's even subtext here about the idea that Nadako was, until this point, not really a character. The arc opens up with Nadako reading off a list of facts about herself akin to what you might find on someone's Facebook About page or an RPG stat sheet, in reference to how we only really know the aesthetic, surface-level details of who Nadako is. This intention becomes clearer when Ogi asks Nadako if she thought that she was a person whose life couldn't become a real story. It's like she's telling Nadako that it's time for her to emerge as an actual character. Nadako is confronted again and again by characters accusing her of essentially being lazy, cowardly, and intellectually dishonest, using her cuteness to dodge responsibility and hide away from pain and effort. She's pretty much dragged through the mud for being just a moe girl with no real character. It's only after Tsukihi finally pushes her over the edge by cutting her bangs that Nadako finally explodes in a fantastic scene of fury which finally sees her coming into her own. Watching the useless shy girl who hadn't even been a character before evolve into an insane god who murders everyone was one of the most entertaining things to happen in this show and was definitely a little bit fascinating. At this point, I think it's safe to say that the Monogatari series has come full circle. If Bakemonogatari was a series of little stories that built on one another to ultimately tell a complete story of romance and friendship, Monogatari's second series simultaneously presents new stories while also continuing the narrative in a meaningful way. Tsubasa Tiger and Nadako Medusa more or less seem to close the books on those characters' as feelings and relationships with Araragi, at least for the time being, and it's clear that as more elements emerge, this story is growing into a larger narrative. Most of it builds off from the first season's minutia, taking a love story with a happy ending and following through into the next stage of life for these characters, even if it's still in a relatively small time frame. Mayoi Zhangshi might 
might seem like an outlier in this situation, but Mayoi has always been an outlier as the one friend who wasn't really in love with Aradagi or Hitagi romantically, and the arc had more to do with building Shinobu into a character who would be highly important going forward. Whether or not Nisioi seen planned all of this from the beginning is hard to say, but I think it's more likely that he had planted things into his story that he'd be able to touch on again later if he wanted to. A one-off linguistic joke about how Nadako might become the final boss at the start of Tsubasa Cat arc manifests into actual truth. A storyline that originally developed Aradagi in Tsubasa Cat now comes around to develop Hanekawa in Tsubasa Tiger. When I talked about Bakemonogatari, I often considered the girls that Aradagi encountered to be stand-ins for the development of his and Hitagi's relationship. In series 2, each of these characters makes their marks as an individual, and with the Nadako Medusa arc it feels for the first time like this may not be a simple story of the random incidents Aradagi and his friends encounter around town, but a larger, more connected narrative leading towards an eventual conclusion. It's strange to think about how different a beast the series becomes as each new layer is built onto it with its passing arcs. So then we get to Shinobu time, which may be the weakest narrative in the season so far, even though it has a good ending and some decent character development. It acts as a reversal on Mayoi Zhangshi, as this time instead of Mayoi being a plot device for Shinobu's development, Shinobu is a plot device for Mayoi's development. Also like Mayoi Zhangshi, it only features Aradagi, Mayoi, Shinobu, and more prominently than before, Yotsugu as major characters, and contains an uncharacteristically large amount of expository dialogue. Unfortunately, the story is less engaging or ridiculous than that of Mayoi Zhangshi, and really feels like it has no business taking up four whole episodes. It amounts to a very roundabout closing of Mayoi's arc, with her character actually dying, or well, going to heaven or whatever, at the end. It was a great end to her character and a good final scene, but the journey to get there seemed unnecessarily messy and random. Perhaps what really killed it though was just being the most visually boring arc of the Monogatari franchise to date. Earlier, I said that a lot of people have accused Shinbo of not really directing the shows that he's been credited on, and I started to understand what they meant while I was watching Monogatari's second series. Nisei Monogatari had somewhat toned down the bizarre visual style of Bake Monogatari, but it seemed to have done so because the increased budget meant that they could pull off more impressive feats of animation instead of using stylistic tricks to coat a lack of animation. Monogatari's second series does something similar, but the budget is a lot more spread out and there aren't anywhere near the same number of high intensity sequences that Nisei Monogatari had. Shinobu time is the point where the animation starts to get a little bit janky, and there's not much at all in the way of stylistic flourish to make up for it. The exception is the second episode, which consists mostly of very long panning shots of pretty cool looking still images, which is a neat stylistic flourish but quickly gets old when nearly 20 minutes are spent watching really slow panning shots of still images. As much as I've grown to like the combination of Aradagi and Shinobu, I really don't think the dialogue or visuals in this arc live up to the quality of the franchise on the whole, and would probably find the entire arc unmemorable if not for its climax. For once, this is less a matter of whether the product is fascinating or not, but more a matter of the overall quality not being up to standard. Hitagi End features perhaps the most interesting narrator switch yet, as Kaiki Deshu takes the reins. Kaiki has been the only real villainous presence in the series so far, albeit a deliberately petty one who's willing to throw anyone under the bus to make a little cash and has no interest in anything that would cause him a loss. Being trapped in the Karen B arc meant that he never really got to leave a big impression, as that arc was such an unfocused clusterfuck and his small appearances since haven't added much, so getting to be the narrator for an arc immediately fleshed him out far more than he ever had been in the past, and his narration brings a very different energy from that of the other characters. If anything, he has the most down-to-earth worldview yet, and regular people actually exist and move around in his reality without being obscured as they are in Nadako's world. Right from the start, Hitagi N feels like it really is building up to the climax of all that's come before. We've already determined that Nadako is supposed to murder Araragi and Hitagi on graduation day, and this arc tells of how Hitagi contracts Kaiki to try and prevent it from happening. The story is structured like a detective's novel, and Kaiki even changes his look to that of a detective in the name of going undercover. Despite his rather circular way of thinking, Kaiki manages to be the most straightforward narrator yet, creating perhaps the most focused storyline of the show so far. Of course, as is common to the series, the majority of the arc takes place in absurdly long conversations, much of which is a constant back and forth of clarifications. Kaiki and Hitagi are paired up a lot, and both of them have pretty similar manners of speaking, which the show handles with awareness as it almost places them in a contest with one another. For once, however, most of the dialogue at least feels like it's going somewhere, and even if a lot of the circular semantics aren't necessary, at least this time there's enough gravity to the story to lend dramatic weight to these conversations. It's the polar opposite of the Karen B arc. This time, every scene feels relevant, and the sense of drama and suspense remains heavy. Towards the back end of the arc, Kaiki undergoes some surprising character developments that cast his actions in the past in a different, if not better, light, and fleshes him out into a more interesting character. Likewise, Nadeko gets a few more character beats during the surprisingly satisfying confrontation between 
between the two. As Kaiki puts it to Aradagi, he tells Nadeko obvious things that adults tell children, which amounts to a very straightforward resolution of the entire situation meant to leave the viewer with the warm fuzzies. Of course, Nisioisin would never be satisfied ending a story this way, so Kaiki is randomly murdered by one of his past fraud victims right at the end of the episode. Yeah. Ouch. While not illogical, this comes off for now as mostly a shock value thing, which is kind of upsetting, but it's possible that some later part of the story might tie it together. Whether or not this is a forgivable way to undercut the happy ending is up to the viewer though. Fascinating or not, I do think that Hitagi End shoots down the middle of everything Monogatari second series has to offer in comparison to the first two shows. Bake Monogatari used its ghost stories and wacky interactions between wacky Moe parody characters as the backdrop to an excellent emotional love story. Nisei Monogatari then highlighted the textural elements of the story and ignored anything dramatic or emotional. Finally, Monogatari's second series focused on the dramatic but doesn't really have much in the way of the emotional. It takes the characters, setting, and style from Bakemonogatari and plugs them into a dramatic storyline full of twists and turns and high stakes consequences, but it no longer forges strong emotional connections. I've seen fans of the Monogatari series choose any of the arcs or any of the series as their favorite. I wouldn't say that any of them is necessarily better or worse than any of the others at getting done whatever they set out to do, but in turn this means that what you like most about the series will likely be what determines the arc you like best, either because you like certain characters the most, or because you like certain textural elements, or because you like the more dramatic storylines, or the more emotional ones, or the fan service scenes, the Monogatari series has many forms of appeal. And I wouldn't say that any of it completely failed for me, except for maybe the Nadako Snake and Tsukihi Phoenix arcs. I enjoyed the fan service, the drama, the dialogue, most of the characters by the end, and more than anything, the emotions of the first series. None of these are shows that I would rate badly, though without question I feel most strongly towards Bake Monogatari, followed by the second series, followed by Nisei Monogatari. Reason being that even on a purely textural level, Monogatari is almost inherently enjoyable to me. As someone who has been a diehard fan of Akiyuki Shinbo and Studio Shaft since 2007, that's hardly surprising. However, beyond what the textural elements account for, the dramatic storyline is effective, but not nearly as effective as many others I've seen. Even the emotional stuff, while while very strong isn't the best ever, I wouldn't even give Bake Monogatari more than a 9 out of 10 score. That's what makes this whole breakdown so interesting to me in the first place, that between these three series I can clearly define what I look for in a show just by looking at what a story becomes when it plays either purely to texture or to texture with drama and or emotions driving it. In conclusion, I find that texture alone while enticing to me is not enough to make me love a story in the way an emotional core is capable of doing so. But wait, I'm not done here. While I was writing this post, yet another Monogatari installment was released in the form of the five-episode special, Suruga Devil. While I say five episodes, it seems that official releases consider it more like a continuous film, with the opening and endings only playing once. Moreover, even though Suruga Devil does take place after Hitagi End in the series timeline, it's worth mentioning that the original novel was published in between Mayoi Zhangshi and Nadako Medusa. Knowing this makes it strange that Suruga Devil actually feels like a satisfying resolution to the arcs that came before, especially since it raises even more questions about what's happened in the time between Hitagi End and here. It's not surprising that Hitagi and Araragi have moved on to college, though knowing this before even Nadako Medusa would have undercut the tension pretty harshly in a way that is normal for Nisioi scene. More importantly though, Kaiki Deishu is still alive somehow, and now has a goatee and glasses so he looks like Gendo Ikari. He finally meets up with Kanbaru as he's been promising to do throughout the series, and gives a show-stopping speech about the beauty of eating meat that legit elevated him to one of my favorite characters in the series. Speaking of favorite characters, Suruga really gets to come into her own in this arc, not only with a fairly interesting story and her own rival character, but also in a pretty emotional way that better contextualizes her relationship with Araragi and Senjogahara. In some ways, it's like the twisted Monogatari version of what Azusa experiences towards the end of Kaon. Suruga Devil is an altogether pleasant arc, as even with the bits of pedantic Nisio speeches, it manages to create an interesting character conflict and some heartfelt moments. I recommend reading the post that I've linked below that AJ the Fourth wrote, which dives into some cool personal anecdotes relating to this arc as well. This may well be the closest that the Monogatari series has gotten to reaching the heights that Bake Monogatari did, and it leaves me with hope that more great stuff like this may be in store down the road. Given the impressive success of the franchise so far, and the fact that only 12 of the 18 total novels have been adapted, there's a good chance we will be seeing more Monogatari anime in the future, especially if the Kizu Monogatari film ever actually gets finished. The final book will be released September 19th, 2014, which is not long after this post will be published, so I'm curious to see or hear about how it all concludes. And 
well, that about wraps it up. Thanks for listening. Check out some more videos on my channel if you like what you heard here or read them on my blog or whatever. And if you really, really like this stuff and you want me to be able to keep making it, then uh, hit me up on Patreon or PayPal and make some donations so that I can keep doing this as a full-time profession. And see you next time.